Good afternoon, and welcome to this National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable webinar. Um, it was really introducing our risk assessment and screening toolkit, which was designed uh, to help detect familial, hereditary, and early onset colorectal cancer. My name is Dennis Hahn, and I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and Director of Genetics at Gastroenterology of the Rockies. I'm also a member of the, NAP, of the Roundtable Steering Committee and co-chair of the Family History and Early Onset Colorectal Cancer Task Group. It's, it's a real treat for me to help moderate uh, this webinar today. I want to thank you all for coming. We've had a lot of interest in this topic, and we really appreciate your time. We hope you'll find this toolkit as valuable as we hope you do. Um, the purpose of, the, of this webinar today uh, is to introduce um, uh, this uh, toolkit. As you know, colon cancer is a common and potentially lethal uh, disease. It's the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. And it's estimated that there will be over 140,000 new cases this year uh, in this country alone. As you know, also, family history is an important risk factor for colorectal cancers. Individuals with a first degree relative with colorectal cancer are at least two times a higher likelihood of developing colorectal cancer themselves. And that risk increases with earlier ages of diagnosis and the number of relatives diagnosed with colorectal cancer. It's recommended that those with a family history of colorectal cancer start screening by age 40 or earlier based on the strength of their family history rather than at age 45 or 50 for the average risk population. So it's really important to identify this group. Currently, there are substantial limitations in the collection and use of family history for risk assessment, uh, and, and this has become a serious barrier and has been a serious barrier to successful uh, cancer screening. Screening and prevention efforts for those with a family a familial or hereditary risk requires both the collection and use of accurate family history information. This toolkit was developed for primary care practices because they play the, the pivotal role in identifying people at increased colorectal cancer risk and facilitating recommended screening. This new roundtable toolkit aims to improve the ability of primary care clinicians to systematically collect, document, and act on a family history of colorectal cancer and adenomatous polyps while at the same time educating clinicians on the need for more timely diagnostic testing for young adults who present with alarm signs or symptoms of colorectal cancer and ensuring that these patients receive a proper diagnostic workup. The purpose of today's webinar is to introduce the new uh, risk assessment and screening toolkit. We'll start by reviewing why the Roundtable Family History and Early Age Onset Colorectal Cancer Task Group took on this important project, why we think it's important. And we'll then take time to walk uh, through uh, all of the toolkit, all that the toolkit can offer, particularly demonstrating how the toolkit can be implemented within a system and how it can improve care for patients. Finally, we'll look toward the broader implications of family history co collection and the continued efforts needed to better address these challenges. If I can advance this slide, that's great. Um, before diving into the, uh, the meat of the, uh, the webinar, I wanted to show you a screenshot of the Roundtable Resource Center. As you all know, uh, so that you all know how to get a copy of the new two cut as well as the companion quick start guide, uh, both of which are now available on, on this resource center. I hope many of you have had a chance to see the new uh, roundtable.org website and that you are fi finding the interactive resource center helpful to your work. The web, the link is nccrt.org. You can navigate to the resource center from M any page uh, on the website by finding it listed in the main navigation menu at the top of our site. And you can see it circled on this slide. Uh, once in the resource center, you can find a number of evidence-based innova innovations and tools to increase colorectal cancer screening in, a, in really a range of settings and populations. There are filters that are available to search by setting. Uh, by target audience, by intervention type, and more. And it really makes it pretty easy to find tools tailored to working in specific populations. You can also use the search bar if you know the name of a particular resource or a topic that you'd like to learn more about. Finally, users can also submit their own resources. It's truly a one-stop shop to find available uh, valuable tools to help you with your work, and I encourage you to check it out and visit it often, I hope. The presenters uh, for today's webinar, uh, you'll hear from, are listed here. Paul Troy is Professor of Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and co-chair of the Family History and Early Age Onset Colorectal Test Group. Uh, 
Emily Edelman uh, is, has really been central to the development of this uh, uh, toolkit at Jackson's Laboratory. She's the Associate Director of Clinical and Continuing Education at the Jackson Laboratory. And Dr. Tom Weber is the Director of Surgical Oncology at Northwest Regional at North, Northwell Health, and he's the Chair Emeritus of the Roundtable and Co-Chair of the Family History and Early Age Onset Colorectal Test Group. So each of these individuals will, will present uh, a piece of the webinar today. Before we get started, I'd finally like to, take, to share three housekeeping items with you. The, uh, first, we're recording the webinar. The replay and speaker slides will be shared with you within a few days. Please feel free to share with your colleagues and, and anyone who is not able to join us today. Secondly, uh, because there's a large number of participants, uh, all the participants, participants will be muted on today's webinar. Uh, but we're very keen for you to ask questions by submitting them through the webinar Q&A function, which is in the lower right-hand portion, portion of the screen. Uh, we'll have time for questions after the presentations, and we'll answer as many as we can. And we'll also be emailing around responses to any questions if we don't have time to get to them. And feel free to mail us uh, with any specific questions uh, afterwards. Finally, uh, we're always trying to improve our webinar. So, if, if, so we're asking your help in evaluating the webinar. You'll receive an email with a survey link. We really hope you'll fill it out. Um, and it'll help us um, by taking just a few minutes to provide feedback. We take this advice very seriously. Uh, as we try to uh, improve these webinars. Uh, and now I'm going to pass uh, the mic uh, to Paul Troy uh, for the first portion of this uh, presentation. I hope you've got it, Paul. I hope so as well. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As one of the co-chairs of the Family History and Early Age Onset Colorectal Cancer Task Group, my goal is to briefly describe who we are and provide a bit of background on why we decided to create the toolkit. As many of you may know, our Family History Task Group was founded in 2012 and later expanded in 2016 to include early onset colorectal cancer. Our charge is to identify key issues and areas of need around familial, inherited, and early onset colorectal cancer for the purposes of identifying opportunities for the roundtable to be a catalyst for change. Now, our task group themes have included helping clinicians develop a system-based approach to the identification and management of patients at familial risk, as well as the recommendation for early diagnostic evaluation of those presenting with signs or symptoms of colorectal cancer at any age to improve electronic health records to help facilitate needed screening and or counseling recommendations for patients with a family history, to increase clinician, patient, and intrafamily communication about familial and heritable risk, to improve on-time screening for the 50 to 55 and perhaps now 45 to 55 population according to recommended guidelines, and to address the increase in colorectal cancer in young adults through strategic planning and interactions with key stakeholders and thought leaders. These themes have served as a guide for the work of the task group since its inception. Although we have undertaken a number of projects that address individual themes, we felt that a more comprehensive resource would be of great value. The Jackson Laboratory was therefore commissioned after a competitive bid process to develop a practice transformation clinician's toolkit on family history and early onset colorectal cancer. The goals of the toolkit were to bridge the existing knowledge gap and to provide a step-by-step -step detailed guide for practices dedicated to improving their processes related to the collection of family history and acting on that information according to recommended guidelines, and to provide guidance on the appropriate diagnostic evaluation of patients with alarm signs or symptoms of colorectal cancer, regardless of age. We recognize that electronic health records have great promise regarding systematic collection and analysis of family history, but also acknowledge that there are a number of challenges to achieving this potential in clinical practice. While a few EHR systems have robust family history functions, most do not allow for the level of documentation that is needed to accurately assess risk. The Roundtable and American Cancer Society are actively working to educate stakeholders about the value of family history population health management and accountable care. While these efforts are underway, we commissioned this toolkit to provide a practical support 
to primary care practices trying to navigate family history collection and risk assessment today. Emily will talk briefly about how the toolkit addresses the use of both EHRs and external family history tools to meet the needs of patients and providers. So without further ado, ado I will pass, excuse me, pass the mic to Emily so she can tell us about the toolkit. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as was introduced earlier, I'm Emily Edelman from the Jackson Laboratory, and I'm very pleased to be here to speak with you today about our new toolkit, the Risk Assessment and Screening Toolkit to Detect Familial, Hereditary, and Early Onset Colorectal Cancer. So this toolkit aims to help primary care practices identify patients at increased and high risk based on personal and family history, apply colon cancer screening guidelines based on risk, refer high-risk patients to genetics for appropriate evaluation and consideration of testing, and recognize and rapidly diagnose patients who are presenting with a possible colon cancer. And at the heart of all of this is accurate and efficient family history collection. So rather than just listing out the toolkit content and messages, we wanted to use a patient scenario to highlight the different points in the patient journey for which intervention may be needed to, and to demonstrate how the toolkit is designed to help primary care providers along this path of family history collection, risk assessment, and management. So here's our patient, Maya. Here's what we know about her. She's presenting to establish care with a new practice. She's 34. She's married with one child, and on her intake form, she reports that she has a family history of colon cancer, that her father had colon cancer at, at 62. And so this is where we have the first opportunity and potentially the first roadblock to make sure this patient is getting the care that she needs related to her colon cancer. How is this patient related to the family history? How is this patient going to get assessed? And if there is a clinically significant cancer risk, how do we make sure she doesn't fall through the cracks? And so first, there needs to be a system in place to actually assess this patient. And this is where the toolkit begins with its guidance. It covers how to develop a systematic team-based approach to family history collection and interpretation, and that includes utilizing members of the practice team, not just the primary care provider using the EHR and or external tools to assist in family history collection and risk assessment, and standardizing how and where family history data is recorded in the medical record to increase the usability of this information. And so the toolkit addresses how to accomplish all of these steps and more as we'll discuss. We've designed the toolkit with usability in mind. So to help the provider and practice execute the processes and tasks outlined in the toolkit, we provide simple, simple stepwise instruction for each topic area, each task, and that's also paired with tools and tips that are aimed to, to support the process. And, and these screenshots, screenshots I'm showing, I know you can't see everything, it's pretty small text, um, so this is just intended to illustrate these different elements of the toolkit, and then happily you all now have access to this, so you can uh, go to nccrt.org and, and access the toolkit yourself. So here's an example of, of this kind of implementation support of, of a particular process. We have this in a sidebar. There's links to related tools, ways to access resources to learn more about the topic, information on potential barriers, um, and a list of essential team members who might be involved in implementing this task, and when applicable, links to patient materials. We have example workflows a curated list of tools, like family history tools that might be useful for practice, and worksheets to help implement different parts of this family history system. So as Dr. Schroy said, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this particular tool, this, this family history tool features worksheet. Um, as Dr. Schroy said, the ideal scenario would be that practices could use their EHR for all of their family history collection, documentation, and risk assessment needs, but the reality is that many EHR systems don't support the level of documentation that's needed to accurately assess and follow up on risk. So for practices that do have access to that functionality, that's great. For the practices that don't have that functionality right now, they often need to look to external family history tools to aid in family history collection and or risk assessment. 
And there are dozens of family history tools available with different design and functionality. No one tool is exactly the same, and of course that means that each of these tools has its own strengths and weaknesses. So the approach we've taken in the toolkit is to provide guidance on how to evaluate these numerous tools to identify the best fit for a given practice's needs. So let's talk through how this can work with an example. Um, one of the early sections of the toolkit is to help the practice team identify what are their primary goals for collecting family history or for using family history of the practice. So in this scenario, the practice has gone through that process and said that our goals are to, one, identify patients who are increased or high risk of colon cancer, two, apply screening guidelines to these patients based on their risk, and three, refer high risk patients to genetic services for further evaluation. And so then the next step that is outlined in the toolkit is to look at these goals and say, what are your, what, what do you want the family history tool to do in order to support these goals? And the practice goes through that process and says, okay, we want, we want to make sure that we're getting structured collection of at least first and secondary relatives. That's not just free text, something being written or typed in. We want this structured so that it could be potentially used for risk assessment or decision support in an automated way. Uh, the practice wants the, the, there to be an option for patient-entered family history data. They want this to be done in an electronic questionnaire. They do want there to be risk assessment support with the tool, and they don't have a budget for this, so they want it to be free. So based on that information, identifying those goals and, and identifying their desired features, they can use this worksheet that we've developed and provided in the toolkit. I know it's small, um, but uh, it's available in the toolkit, and it's actually available through a Google spreadsheet so that people can download it and modify it and use it however they need. Um, the, the, but using this, this uh, tool, this worksheet, the practice can go through and check their desired features and then filter based on this list of family history tools that's on the y-axis to identify those that might meet their desired needs. And in this scenario, the, there are five family history tools that meet those criteria. Um, so the practice can then look at this list of five rather than a list of 25 or 50 tools and test these tools and select one that will be, that will be, that will best meet their needs. So we've been talking a lot about family history, and this is a major focus of the toolkit, but we know that that's not all that's needed in order to make sure patients are getting appropriately screened and managed. So the toolkit addresses these additional steps after thinking through the family history collection and risk assessment process. You need to be able to select what screening guidelines you're gonna use for practice. There's a number of colon cancer screening guidelines out there, and practices may have different preferences and needs about which sets of guidelines to use. Um, identify the cancer and genetic specialist for referral and collaboration on increased and high-risk patients. Identify patient materials to support patients throughout the process. And consider using some of the evidence-based interventions that have been shown to increase CRC screening adherence. So these could be additional interventions that could be implemented to help patients actually carry through and adhere to screening recommendations. And of course, part of this process is to evaluate the process, look at outcomes, and then go back and update and modify things as needed. So once we've established this process for collecting structured family history, we can actually implement it for patients like Maya, who I presented earlier, to assess her individual risk and determine next steps in her management. And this is where the toolkit gets more into the nuts and bolts of risk assessment and management for a given patient. And this is where it provides a lot of the, more of the education about key knowledge and skills that are needed to support these activities. So in order to assess risk, for a given patient, you need to actually collect that sufficient family history information, assess patterns and red flags in that patient's personal and family history, and then assign that patient to a, cat a risk category, average, increased, or high risk. And this is where we want to get to when we apply a structured system for family history collection. Now the output will look different depending on the tool. So on the left I have a pedigree, on the right I have family history in a table or narrative form. But these are providing similar information, these different outputs. At a minimum, we want the family history to documentation to include who in the family has disease, what is their relationship to the patient and other affected individuals, what are the specific cancers or conditions 
people in the family have, ages of onset, and ideally including both affected and unaffected individuals because that informs risk assessment. And this is the level of detail that we need to accurately assess cancer risk, which is the next step. So the next step, as I said, the clinician should be able to identify genetic red flags and any patterns that point to genetic risks in the family. And genetic red flags are those things that suggest a familial or hereditary cause to the cancer. In this family, we see multiple affected relatives with cancer, and we see early age of onset. So we see that Maya has two relatives with colon cancer, that she has an aunt with endometrial cancer, and that she has an uh, uncle with gastric cancer, and that we see there is a young age of onset in her cousin with colon cancer diagnosed at the age of 43. So then we would also say, are there, we'd also ask the question, are there any patterns of cancer in the family? And this could be looking for an inheritance pattern and or could be saying, are there any cancers that are associated together? So we, we see these two colon cancers, which obviously are um, maybe associated, and then we look at the colon cancers and the endometrial and the gastric and ask, could these be related? And the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, colon, endometrial, and gastric cancers can be associated together in Lynch syndrome, which can confer a high risk of these cancers as well as others. So this is an important piece of our risk assessment is to recognize this pattern of cancer in the family. And if you look at these things together, it's not it's not definitive, but it looks like it could be autosomal dominant inheritance as well. So that's another piece that we consider in the risk assessment. So wrapping this up for Maya, she is indeed at high risk because of the red flags and the patterns that we see here of multiple affected relatives with not only colon cancer, but these associated cancers that can be seen in a hereditary colon cancer syndrome, Lynch, early age of onset, and then that possible dominant pattern. So what comes next? Um, going back to what's the next part of the toolkit. The next steps are to communicate the, this risk to the patient and manage the patient based on risk. And the toolkit has these things separated into different steps, but I like to talk about them together because they often are happening at the same time interwoven in a, in a real clinical scenario. So this includes things like, uh, provides instruction on using that patient risk level, so Maya's high risk, to adapt the plan for cancer screening, surveillance, prevention, and genetic referral as appropriate, to communicate recommend these recommendations to the patient and engage the patient in shared decision making about screening and management options, to recommend that the patient share risk information with relatives, if applicable, and to evaluate patients who are presenting with alarm signs and symptoms for possible colon cancer. And again, um, we have the same kind of stepwise instruction and support for the clinical actions, things that you would evaluate for a given patient, as well as we did for the previous section on setting up the process at the practice level. We provide different tools. So here's an example to the accessing services tool that gives links about how to find genetics professionals as well as how to communicate with patients about a referral. Um, here's an example of external education. This is a free online CME course that clinicians can access to practice some of the skills that are highlighted in the toolkit. And coming back to Maya here, uh, thinking about these communication and management steps, how would this apply to her? Um, well, if we've done this successfully, our high-risk patient of Maya would be identified for referral to cancer genetics, where she would receive genetic counseling and she would be offered, or the family would be offered genetic testing for Lynch syndrome and potentially other, other genes associated with hereditary colon cancer. And then depending on the results of that genetic evaluation and testing, Maya would have personalized management and prevention and surveillance guidelines if she is determined to still be, to continue to be at high risk. And Maya should also be aware that of the signs and symptoms of colon cancer because she is at high risk. Now, I want to note that this is an emphasis in the toolkit for all patients regardless of risk level, that clinicians should be aware that the incidence of early onset colon cancer is on the rise um, and that a substantial portion of early onset colon cancer may be prevented or detected at an earlier stage by identifying people with a family history of cancer or adenomas. But regardless of the family history, regardless of risk factors, colon cancer should be considered in all individuals with alarm signs and symptoms. So the toolkit discusses this and provides this um, useful list of symptoms that would warrant further evaluation for colon cancer. 
So putting this all together, I've given you a pretty whirlwind, high-level tour of the toolkit, um, but hopefully this has given you a view of the major parts and pieces. We've developed a comprehensive family history and early onset toolkit. And as I've gone through this overview, I've, I've tried to highlight some of the design features here that we hope are especially useful for practices and clinicians. So this is intended to support application of skills and clinical implementation. Each section highlights stepwise instruction to support this end. The toolkit has tools and worksheets with worked examples, case studies of how different practices have approached implementation. It has a fairly extensive appendix with guidelines and patient and provider resources. And the toolkit is designed so that a practice can customize their own experience, sort of build your own toolkit. Each section of the toolkit provides the information you need to complete a single task, like, for example, where, figuring out where you're going to document family history information, so that you can create a customized toolkit by assembling only the pages that are relevant for your practice needs. We expect some people will want to read the whole toolkit, and other people, depending on what their practice needs are and where they are in their own implementation process, uh, may find certain sections of the toolkit more helpful. So we've designed it to try to support both use cases. All right, um, we're nearing the end of my part. As Dr. Anand said, we, the toolkit is now available at the NCCRT website. Um, you can download the full comprehensive toolkit. We've also provide, developed a quick start version of the toolkit. And the goal of the quick start is a quick reference or really to provide an overview um, of what is included in the toolkit so that people can see, get a sense of where they might want to begin to engage or um, just get this overview before diving in and, and, and starting down the journey of actually implementing the full toolkit in their practice. We've also created a web-enabled web -enabled version of content so that people, again, can support, this will support the customization of the toolkit for practice needs um, and allowing people to easily view sex, select sections of interest before downloading and they, before using the whole thing, they can download those sections of interest. So we're hoping that that will be useful to people as well. So of course, there are some limitations to this toolkit. Um, I'm going to review this list briefly and then would be happy to talk more about this in any of the, during the Q&A if people have questions. So the toolkit, as I've highlighted it, is, it really focuses on family history and focuses on early onset cancer, uh, for co early onset colon cancer. It is not comprehensive in the sense that it doesn't address all aspects of colon cancer genetics. So it's really focused on the primary care provider, most common roles around family history detection and managing patients with different risk levels and detecting early onset cancer, detecting cancer. This has a colon cancer focus, obviously, um, and that is, uh, that is uh, contrasting it to being a resource that does, that supports comprehensive risk assessment across all conditions. And we know that this is um, an important consideration for primary care practices. So we have tried to, as we were developing the, the content on setting up a system, uh, thinking about family history collection practices, and the principles for risk assessment and management, we've really tried to make these broadly applicable across cancers and across common conditions that would be relevant for primary care, but of course, the specific examples are focused on colon cancer. We found as we were developing the toolkit that in some places there was limited evidence-based best practices, so in those places we relied on expert consensus from our wonderful group of advisors. We've talked a bit about um, limitations currently with EHRs and related to family history collection and using external family history tools. The toolkit assumes that people are ready to implement when they go to use the toolkit. So it assumes that there's organizational buy-in and some support and resources available to to turn to this effort. Um, the toolkit also assumes that, as I've mentioned, that there's going to be some need for customization and modification based on the fact that practices have different needs, patient pop different patient populations have needs. So again, we've tried to design to that end. So looking ahead, oops, excuse me, um, we are 
very, very, very pleased to be getting the toolkit out. Um, a lot of people have put a lot of work into this, so we're delighted to be launching this today. And um, this is the first of what will be a number of dissemination activities through NCCRT as well as the Jackson Laboratory will be supporting this effort. We are looking forward to implementation and learning about how the toolkit works in practice. Um, so if you are listening to this and think that your practice might be interested to use the toolkit or you have colleagues who might be interested um, and would like to talk with us about collaborating towards implementation, evaluating the toolkit, we would love to talk with you about that. So I want to acknowledge the wonderful team of people who have worked on this, especially Therese Ingram from the Jackson Laboratory, the co-chairs who are on this call of the, of the NCCRT Family History and Early Onset Task Force, our wonderful advisors and reviewers, um, NCCRT and ACS leadership, and of course our funding that made this possible from the ACS and CDC. So that wraps up my presentation, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Weber. Oh, I lost, hang on just a sec, let's try that again. Okay, I think I've handed it over to you, Dr. Weber. Okay, thank you so much, Emily. Let's see if we're working. Yes, we're working, great. But I can't go back. Okay. Well, welcome, and uh, again, thank you, Emily, for that outstanding 30,000-foot uh, overview of the toolkit, and uh, we do certainly want to thank everyone who has labored uh, so hard and also so creatively to uh, put together a resource uh, that we think will really help primary care move forward with family health history uh, ascertainment, particularly as regards cancer in general and colorectal cancer in particular. So with that in mind, we just wanted to wrap up uh, briefly with uh, just a few reminders of why uh, this work is really so very, very uh, important. So let's just take a look here. So the first and um, most fundamental, uh, if not uh, disturbing, reason is that ascertainment of uh, cancer family history in American medical practice is, uh, is limited uh, at best. And uh, this is underscored uh, in these bullet points taken from a recent uh, review by um, Dr. Wood's team and published in JCO. And interestingly, uh, these observations were based on uh, clinical oncology practices, which of course we would assume would be highly motivated to ascertain uh, cancer family history in the patients they were seeing who actually all had cancer. But uh, as you can see, uh, there were significant limitations with regard to uh, complete family history in these charts, and we're talking a major uh, effort here reviewing over 10,000 medical oncology records. So uh, incomplete family history was a consistent feature. Um, just the fact that the age of diagnosis uh, was often missed uh, is, uh, is chilling uh, because, of course, age of diagnosis is a primary marker uh, for potential uh, heritable or familial risk. So this is a very sobering, uh, very sobering data. You can also see, perhaps not surprisingly, but uh, definitely an opportunity for improvement. Most oncologists uh, seem to do a better job uh, recording family history and going into detail for breast cancer patients than they did for colorectal cancer uh, patients. So just a reminder. Uh, the importance of staying alert and uh, paying attention uh, to colorectal cancer across the medical experience for our, our patients. So as the toolkit itself uh, points out and very nicely illustrates both in prose and uh, with some very nice graphics, uh, 
um, at least one in 250 of us uh, have a hereditary cancer syndrome. I think that's a conservative uh, number, but it's still uh, a very important number to keep in mind. And in addition, one in 10 individuals, in fact, have an increased risk for cancer based on, on family history. And then uh, in a very recent article, just a matter of weeks ago, by uh, Rick Boland and his team, uh, they underscored that um, 15 to 20 percent of colorectal cancer diagnoses do occur in individuals who actually have at least one first degree relative with the disease. So if we were effectively identifying these positive family histories, we could absolutely uh, save, save lives. So a positive first degree family history for colorectal cancer uh, as illustrated in Jan Lowry's excellent paper, which is another uh, product of the uh, familial and early age onset task group that Dennis referred to. In that excellent paper is data supporting uh, this increased uh, risk. But uh, this, this uh, issue is, is a bit more uh, nuanced and uh, there's more to learn and more to do. So in a very impressive uh, recently published uh, study by Perlman and Heather Hample's uh, group from Ohio State, uh, looking at over 500 early age onset uh, colorectal cancer cases, doing a very, very diligent review of family history and genetics. Um, the data supported uh, the notion that uh, close to 50 percent of these cases might have been identifiable through diligent family history review. Now, this is a bit aspirational, I think, but nevertheless, uh, the data is the data. And um, you can read in the results section that 19 percent of the people in this study uh, reported that they had at least one first degree relative with colorectal cancer. So again, there's that magic uh, 20 percent. And uh, those are 20 percent of colorectal cancer cases that might have been prevented if adequate family history had been ascertained in a timely fashion and people had been directed to appropriate screening and surveillance following our existing guidelines uh, starting at age 40 or 10 years before the earliest case in the family. So a significant percentage of cases could be prevented, again, by uh, diligent cancer family health history ascertainment. The article also was uh, very um, enlightening in that it uh, focused attention on the significance of first degree relative advanced adenoma history. So this is another important uh, arena and opportunity for all of us to pay attention to. And um, it obviously is something that probably most patients and families are not aware of. There are various initiatives also supported by the Roundtable uh, to promote uh, personal and family awareness working with our GI colleagues of a positive advanced adenoma history because it is a significant marker for colorectal cancer risk. So outstanding work from Ohio State. We just wanted to underscore that uh, paying attention to family history and primary care, of course, uh, also helps us protect people from other life-threatening malignancies. As you can see here, uh, breast cancer uh, is obviously one dramatic example. And uh, a family history that demonstrates any of these uh, parameters that you see in front of you here, this is based on NCCN uh, guidelines, any of these. Uh, suggests that genetic counseling and testing is recommended. And this has evolved rapidly over the last uh, five to ten years. And uh, you can see that they're paying attention to this, asking about these things, documenting it, uh, and then acting on it in primary care practice uh, could definitely save lives. And there are other uh, 
many other conditions, uh, life-threatening, uh, that also uh, are amenable to identification through family health history ascertainment. They're so, they're so uh, obvious, as it were, that uh, sometimes we don't give them enough thoughtful consideration, but family history of coronary artery disease is associated with increased personal risk, as is high blood pressure, blood clotting disorders, diabetes, asthma, and prostate cancer, among many other conditions. So promoting a culture in primary care of paying attention to family history, identifying people at increased risk, and then acting to protect them is what this project is all about, and the toolkit uh, really uh, is a state-of-the-art uh, clinical decision support mechanism uh, to help providers address uh, these issues. As Emily said, the electronic medical record uh, is a critical clinical decision support piece. We have a long way to go. Uh, we want to make a shout out to Shelly Yu at ACS CAN and her group that are working extremely diligently to advance uh, progress on improving EHR functionality. Uh, this is an issue that we all need to pay attention to. Uh, it's easy to um, it's easy to blame our primary care physicians for not always uh, getting all the correct family health history information and acting on it. But the reality is they have enormous, uh, enormous clinical responsibilities across an incredible range of issues, and they need uh, clinical decision support tools. And in the digital age, there's really no excuse not to provide them, and the toolkit goes a long way towards laying the groundwork to provide that essential support for our primary care physicians. So uh, as we say, don't live in mystery, know your family history. That's pretty simple and easy to remember. So tell your doctors that and tell all your friends, families, coworkers, anyone you can find on the street uh, because you can definitely save lives by uh, taking a good family history. Uh, these should be some references here. And as you look at that, I will pass this back to Professor Annan who will help us wrap up. Here we go. Dennis, I think you're on. Yeah, thanks, Tom. The, um, that was really great. I really uh, enjoyed that uh, discussion, and I knew a fair amount about the toolkit beforehand. Uh, I really like to thank you, Tom and Emily and, and Paul, for those presentations. And we'd really like to take uh, some time for questions. Uh, we have 15, 20 minutes. Hey, Dennis. So. It's a, sorry, this is Mary. It's a little hard to hear you again. Can you uh, scoot a little closer to the mic? Oh, sure. Sorry. Uh, we want to take some questions now, uh, and we have a few questions to start with. Um, but if you have a question, please submit it in the chat box, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Maybe I can start with a question from Jennifer Brown that, that sort of builds on what you were talking about at the end, Tom. Uh, and, and this is a question probably directed at Emily. And is that, do any of the family history toolkits in the worksheet that you showed include all cancer risks and not just colon cancer? Yes, and that's a great question. Um, and the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so the, the worksheet that I showed includes about 25 different family history tools that we evaluated and tested um, with the primary care practices needs in mind. and. A number of those only collect family history, just are kind of documentation tools, and so all of those collection tools um, support collection beyond just colon cancer. Um, and then many of them, about at least 10 of them, also perform risk assessment for cancers across the board, um, at least breast 
ovarian, colon, and uterine, and, and to some degree more. Um, and then there's also some colon cancer specific kind of questionnaires, interview aids that you could use to, to very simply ask a series of questions to a patient to, within a minute or less, assess is this person at increased or high risk of colon cancer specifically. So I think that summary gives an overview of what I said earlier, that there's really different tools out there and they have different strengths. Um, but to, you know, to, to reiterate, to your question, um, Jennifer, absolutely the tools provided do, um, most of them address collection and or risk assessment beyond just colon cancer. Thanks, uh, Emily. That, uh, Jennifer had one other question as well, and that is whether uh, FQHCs or community health centers uh, where ref direct referral to genetics is really not available. Um, does the toolkit uh, address this issue? Do, are there sample communications to patients about their risk and their family's risk for inherited cases? Are there ways to, for, to access genetic counselors and genetic testing from afar? Great, another, another great question. So um, the toolkit does provide tips for communicating with patient about their risk level um, and also about next steps. So kind of some talking points and things to cover as you're making a referral to a genetics expert, whether that's a, a genetic counselor or, or someone in a traditional genetics clinic or um, there are increasingly different kinds of ways to access genetic experts through online telemedicine companies and things like that. And so the toolkit also provides information about um, different websites and, and ways you can access and find and connect with genetic specialists. So I think there's, there's those two layers. There's how do you find a genetics expert, even if there's not someone in your facility, and then, um, and that's becoming increasingly uh, accessible and, and convenient for patients, and then also, communication aids to talk about risk and to talk about this genetics referral with patients. Uh, great, and the, we've used uh, the telephone-based counseling services in, in one of the hospitals I work at. Uh, it's been it's really quite efficient uh, and is available really to anyone, um, although there is cost, of course, associated with it, mm -hmm. which could be a barrier as well. Uh, let me ask you a question about uh, sort of the practicality of using the toolkit. Uh, if you had a practice and you had some sort of some level of interest in trying to uh, organize the family history collection uh, better and get more out of it, um, how would a practice start? Who in the practice should, for example, go to the toolkit and see what the tools are, and how would they use the the quick step the quick start guide uh, to try to find out whether whether the toolkit really provide something that would be of value to them. How do, how do you really get started using this toolkit, do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great um, a great line of discussion. So we in, as part of our development process for the toolkit, we did a fairly extensive needs assessment and that included getting input from this great group of advisors that convened through NCCRT, but also conducting interviews with primary care providers and practices, and not just physicians and, and the advanced practice nurses, but also um, other people who are are involved in implementing family history and colon cancer screening processes within a practice. People who've, who've, who've already entered into this space and who've been successful or who are maybe in the process of figuring out what works for them. So a few of the lessons learned there were that it really does take a team and that, um, but that you need a champion. So that champion is often a, um, is often one of the physicians in the practice or, or a PA or advanced practice nurse who has an interest in family history. Um, and that's the person who can really keep this moving forward. Um, it may, the champion could also be someone like a practice administrator or um, a nurse coordinator at the practice level um, who, who may also have a team member, one of those providers who, again, can help move the initiative forward. So I think it does help, and we've heard this from people who have been successful, it helps to have that champion that and that initial core team of one or two people who are going to first explore this. And if people are just, again, wanting to, to, to take a, uh, to kind of figure out where to get started, I think you're exactly right, Dr. Anand. I think looking at the quick start guide to just get a sense of the content that's in the toolkit. So that has, it, it has about a quarter of the amount of content as the full toolkit. So that gives you a frame of reference that we included what we felt were the minimum or the essential steps that um, 
that a practice would need if they wanted to get started in this space. So I think that will give people a sense of what are the essential steps in setting up the system and what are the essential steps in terms of clinical care. Um, and then if, if that feels like, if that feels like it's, it's going to be um, something the practice is interested to learn more about and to engage in, I think after reviewing that level, then looking at the full toolkit um, or pulling out additional sections from the full toolkit that might be applicable um, would, would be the next step. And from there, the toolkit provides really start to finish instructions. Like I said, the first step is um, assessing, assess, assessing your existing practice flow, and we provide instructions for how to do that, um, and then setting goals for family history and so on and so forth. Great, the, um, let's move on to a, a little bit of a different area, that, and that is uh, whether the toolkit, the generalizability of the toolkit, uh, and Maya Whitaker uh, asked whether the toolkits have been adapted and tailored uh, to diverse uh, po patient populations. And for the provider tool, tools is whether the toolkit or resource guide uh, that discusses the importance of cultural competence as it relates to family history data collection and communication. Can, my, uh, Emily, maybe you can start with that, but anybody who has uh, comments on that point, uh, feel free to add in. Yeah, I'll be happy to start, but I would love to hear from others because um, part of my answer will leverage the wonderful work that's been done by NCCRT in this space in the past. So, um, you know, I, th I think it's a it's a really good and important point, um, and the the toolkit that we've developed now um, definitely certainly does acknowledge that patients come in patients come into the, the family history and risk assessment process from different places and that depending on the, the patient's community, their personal situation, their culture, um, they, they have different needs, motivations, desires to, um, and concerns about sharing family history, about engaging in genetic counseling and genetic testing. So the toolkit does provide some instruction about and guidance about, um, about how to communicate with patients in a culturally, um, and, and patient in a, in a kind of tailored way, and then provides more links to more resources um, that talk about talk about the different cultural competence issues in more detail. And this is where I'll, I'll say that um, NCCRT has developed some really nice resources here. There's a wonderful program that I don't I don't know the full name, but it's essentially messages to reach the underserved and in particular minority populations who haven't engaged fully in CRC screening. So that's about colon cancer in general, but um, absolutely is applicable to family history and, and the different conversations that primary care providers um, are having with their patients who are are um, have some reluctance or concern to again move forward down the ultimate path of getting evaluated. So I'd love to hear if um, if the other speakers or even Mary has some additional comments on this. Yeah, thanks, um, Emily. That, that I appreciate the uh, the setup there. But yes, we have some resources that are um, developed in close partnership with experts uh, in communicating with Hispanic Latinos as well as Asian American subpopulations. So you can find two companion guides on our in our resource center that give advice on how to talk about colorectal cancer screening in a culturally competent way. Uh, so um, we can, when we send the follow-up replay and slides uh, to all who participated today, we can be sure to include those particular assets um, so everyone can use them as well. That's great. Paul, I know you have a real interest in this area in general. What, what are your thoughts about using this tool in, for example, your population? Right, I mean, I work in a safety net. Uh, healthcare setting, and there are challenges to obtaining accurate family history in, uh, among many of these racial and ethnic groups. Um, it clearly sort of behooves providers to encourage their patients to actually speak with their relatives. I know there are cultural barriers to sharing that kind of information, but that's a critical first step. I know we have a National Family History Day, I think it's around Thanksgiving, which encourages people to speak to their relatives at that time around the Thanksgiving dinner table. Uh, but it is a challenge, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try and we shouldn't empower our patients to try to reach out and get information to help with that issue. Tom, anything to add? No, I concur with all that's been said. It, uh, it, it's incumbent on all of us uh, to uh, make sure we make the effort to be uh, inclusive in these 
very important efforts to uh, ascertain family health history and uh, acknowledge that for some individuals and some families that's not easy but uh, it's always it's always worthwhile starting the conversation and uh, explaining why it's valuable and why it could be useful and uh, and move from there yeah agreed uh, Paul, let me ask you, you, you this question. Uh, it comes, uh, let's see, who's this from? Uh, from Caleb Nearing. Uh, he wanted to know whether uh, it's possible that using this tool, if we really implemented it in a practice, in a primary care practice, whether it would increase costs, their out-of-pocket expenses, uh, either for the institution or the patient, I, I presume. What do you think, Paul? Well, I can't see how it would increase cost. I mean, this is an important aspect of, of patient care is ascertainment of family history. It should be, you know, part of what we do with each and every patient. So I don't know how that part incurs cost. Certainly appropriate screening has a cost component, but I think it's justified. So I'm not sure where the cost is entering into this. There's certainly a time element which could be perceived as costly, and that's where there has to be sort of a, uh, a, a you have to sort of dedicate a workflow that sort of circumvents any of the challenges that impact on, on time. But in terms of actual dollar costs, I don't really see where that comes in. And I think we're doing the right thing by promoting this type of approach to patient care, which really, as Tom pointed out, uh, we don't do a very good job with. Yeah. Uh, Paula, I don't, actually, I think that – go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> no, you, Mary. Uh, Paul, I think the question was not about practice costs, but out of patient costs, particularly for folks with high deductible plans or the uninsured. Well, again, I, um, I mean, insurance plans do vary in what they cover for screening. The most, I think, if you identify yourself as a high-risk patient, uh, there are opportunities to cover those costs for screening. I don't know what your age. Uh, the genetic cost issues, I'm not partitum one. I'm sure that might incur some out-of-pocket costs, so that is a challenge. We just have a little bit of time, and we have a couple of quick questions. So one of them is uh, from Jennifer Dewar, who wanted to know, uh, when it comes to family history of polyps, what's the number of FDRs that their patient must have to be referred for genetic testing? Uh, I, I can have a go at this. So the, the criteria for referral on the basis of polyps is documented. Uh, histologic polyps, histologic adenomas, for example, for familial polyposis is more than 20 or more than 10 if there's some other reason to suggest that if the patient's particularly young or they have a family history of cancer. Uh, so that's the, the number of polyps. With respect to having a first-degree relative with a polyp and that, the risk on that individual, it's primarily folks with advanced adenomas, large or histologically advanced adenomas, and their relatives are about at the same risk as if they, that relative had colorectal cancer. Uh, the last question that I have here is that, uh, first, a thank you. That's very nice uh, uh, from uh, uh, Stacey Hurt. Uh, and she asked an important question. How will you promote buy-in and implementation of the toolkit? Uh, will it be presented at professional society meetings? How will it be evaluated? Tom, you want to take a shot at that? Well, I, I strongly agree with Stacey that that's critical. And uh, I know that discussions are ongoing amongst uh, roundtable leadership uh, in consultation with Jackson Labs to really uh, facilitate dissemination as uh, expeditiously as possible. Uh, those are excellent suggestions. Uh, professional society meetings and other similar platforms uh, are critical. And um, again, I agree with Stacy. This is very, very important, but I, I know that uh, that the round table is on it, and uh, I believe that we will be setting up our own uh, metric systems to see uh, what the uptake is, what the utilization is, and continuing to consult with Jackson Labs on how we can continue to improve that. And I think also we would really appreciate uh, all of your help in, in doing this. If you use the toolkit, uh, providing feedback, uh, letting us know how you used them, how it went, and evaluating this toolkit would be really valuable. So with that, uh, I'd really like to give a huge thank you to uh, all of the speakers for sharing their time and their expertise. 
uh, as well as a thank you to the CDC for providing the funding to make the webinar possible. Uh, and a special thanks to Cleve Lavelle, who really quarterbacked the entire uh, event, uh, and to all of you who have participated. We encourage you to visit the nccrt.org website and connect with us on social media. Uh, to find information about upcoming roundtable webinars and other news. Uh, and for more information on today's webinar, uh, please, you can send an email to nccrt at cancer.org. And finally, I really want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope you did. We hope you found uh, it useful uh, and enjoy the rest of your day.